Broadcasting from the KMF Collective Studio, it's time for the Keep Moving Forward podcast. Join us every week as we dive into the stories of remarkable current and former athletes that have transitioned into the real world. Now here's your host, Katie Galley. Hi everyone, and welcome to the 214th episode of the Keep Moving Forward podcast. I'm your host, Katie Galley. Today in the KMF Collective Studio, I have with me film director, producer, and co-founder of Buttery Bros, Marston Sawyer. How are you doing, Mars? Doing great. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Thank you so much for stopping by and sharing your story with us today. Yeah, stoked to be here. Me too. Well, Mars, just to kind of get to know you a little bit, I wonder, where did you grow up and how, if at all, was your childhood shaped by athletics? Uh, I grew up in Salt Lake City, and I've always kind of been in sports, and I grew up playing a wide variety of things, anything from, like, soccer to baseball, but then later on, I kind of got more into football, and I ended up going to to, uh, college on a scholarship and did that for a while, and then also did uh, uh, Junior Olympic Luge for a few years, so I did that, and then... uh, you know, found CrossFit a little bit later after after my college years. And so, yeah, it's been in my life pretty much my whole <laughs> whole life. Wow. Well, there's definitely a, uh, a lot to unpack there from collegiate football to uh, Junior Olympic Luge. I mean, that's, a, that's like a big variety of, of high-level athletics that you achieved. And so, Mars, um, growing up, I mean, you, like you said, you played in all manner of sports and then leading up into high school and college. Did you always have aspirations to continue on to play a sport at the next level? Was it always football? How did that um, kind of transition come about? Uh, well, it, I kind of had to divide my time between football and luge when I was in high school. Yeah. And I pretty much took luge as far as I could. Like, I was trying to, like, get to the Olympics and stuff like that. And when it turned out that, like, that wasn't looking as prominent as, you know, like a college education and stuff in another four years, I decided to pursue football and went and got a uh, a walk-on scholarship at uh Dixie University and did four years down there and they also happen to have a film department so when I was down there I was able to do kind of two passions like play football and stick stick it out with athletics but also learn a lot more about my craft that I wanted to pursue. Yeah. Um, and that's amazing that you got, you had the opportunity to pursue both, um, continuing your athletic career, but then also, um, developing and learning and finding this love of film and pursuing that. And so before going into that, I mean, your collegiate football career, then, um, with the luge, is that something that is, uh, is that a sport that's big in Salt Lake city? I mean, how did you get involved with the luge? Um, how did you kind of find yourself on this Olympic track? And then once you realized or hit that peak of, okay, I think I'm not going to be able to make it to the Olympics. How did you navigate that transition, even though you had this opportunity to go on and compete at the collegiate level in football? Um, how challenging was it to for you to navigate that? I'm no longer going to pursue this Olympic dream, so I'm going to shift into going to um, college and playing football. Uh, I kind of got into luge just by chance, really. Like My dad had jury duty, and <laughs> When he was doing, when he was in there, like somebody that he was talking to was was kind of explaining what luge was because their kid was doing luge, and they invited us to like try like a street luge, like a wheels clinic, and so I went and did that, and they had like the people there that like kind of scout for the different teams for the youth, and they I guess saw some potential in me, and they invited me to come to Park City to to give it a go on the ice and so I, I don't think it's like real popular because there's really only like two tracks in all of the United States there's one in Park City and one in Lake Placid but it was just so different and it was like such a different uh challenge and you know I did I had known nothing about luge going into it and I didn't even know what I was like signing up for so I kind of got thrown in there and you know I think like one of the first days I like brushed a wall and it like took a bunch of skin off of my arm and I was like, wow, this is, this is intense. And I was like, kind of, dr- I was, I was drawn to the like high speed and the, the thrill of it all. So I, 
you know, pursued that and made it onto the junior Olympic team and did that for a few seasons. And then towards the end of high school, it was looking like, you know, like the 2006 Olympics were like the, the closest one to like try and go for. And when that became like kind of unattainable, I, I had to like ask myself, like, do I want to keep doing this and try and stick it out for another four years and, you know, not, not really pursue school and at the time it was kind of looking like I would have a potential opportunity to walk onto a football team so I kind of decided to go with that and uh it was it was a good four or five years I did that and I'm stoked that I ended up going that way because I ended up you know learning a lot about film and and getting wrapped up in that whole world and that's kind of what led me towards CrossFit and that type of stuff yeah And so Mars, for you, I mean, while this whole, you're having this illustrious athletic career and getting to pursue different things, was that love of film always there? Were you always doing that in the background or that did that come about somehow um, when you went to college? Like I grew up always kind of like picking up cameras and playing with them, not really knowing like exactly what I was doing. But I remember like in, when I was in middle school, I ended up like saving up and I bought like a really bad camera by today's standards, but it was like the coolest thing to be able to like, you know, just shoot videos with my buddies and, and play them back. And I wasn't even editing anything back then. I was just like fascinated with capturing it and like showing it back to people and almost this like entertainment aspect of it. You know, like I like to like entertain people and act kind of like off the wall and a little bit different, but it, uh, it kind of got me going, uh, at an early age kind of pursuing that. And it was something that like really kind of sparked my interest when I got to like, uh, ninth grade when they had this, uh, journalism class that I signed up for, not really knowing what, what I was getting into again. And then that was right around the time that they had those, those, uh, Mac computers that had iMovie on them, but they were like the big domes that were like colorful. Yeah. And, and that was like one of the first times that I'd had, any experience with video editing and that's really where it like blew my mind of how much control and how much like you know you could do in post-production and how much manipulation you could do with clips and sound and music and I really just like fell in love with it in in, in ninth grade and then later on in high school I elected to do uh like half my day at a tech center so they would like I would drive to a different building and they would teach you all the different software and all the different ways that, you, you know, like you could, I guess, different fields you could pursue in post-production and, and media in general. So I did that all of high school. And I knew that that was something that I like. It seemed, it seemed funny to me to think of like, that could be a job. I just thought it was like a hobby or something or just a fun class that I could take it just because it was something that uh, I maybe didn't wrap my mind around how to make it a career, I guess. And so later on into college, when I was, you know, going, going there to play football is like right around the time that they had started their film production, uh, elective in at Dixie university where I ended up graduating. So I went there and kind of got taught a little bit, but for the most part, I really just had to like pursue it on my own and do everything I could like extracurricular activities to be able to like learn different skills and just work with people that were better than me that were willing to teach me, you know, Mm -hmm. so that's kind of how that all happened. And so when you first, I mean, kind of catching that bug and falling in love with the filmmaking and then specifically learning about the post-production process. And so um, going into that, Mars, and then in college, like you said, you really kind of started to come into your own and it was really pursuing it um, to a higher level. You had to go after things on your own. And so as you started to come to the close of college or the coming to close of your collegiate football career, um, looking to that next phase, did you have aspirations to continue your football career or did you have just did you know that you were going to go all in with filmmaking and that's what you wanted to do in the next phase of your life yeah like towards the end of football in college like it was I, I was ready to be done by the time I was coming to an end just because I knew I wasn't going to go on to play in the NFL or anything like that so I was yeah. 
and it, it, it kind of ran its course. Right. So towards the end of school, like I knew that I had like a desire to be able to like tell stories and produce content that I was proud of. Uh, I just didn't really know how or like what I needed to do to go about that. And I didn't know what like industry to like pursue as far as like film or, or like, I, I definitely didn't think it would be in fitness. That's the weird thing is like, I, uh, I guess I just one thing kind of led to another. Like I got out of school and looked for the first job that I could that would let me, you know, get some world world, world experience working for a company. And it was like a, a timeshare company and it was like not what I wanted to be doing, but it was, it was paying me and I was able to like, you know, work, work for somebody and, and prove to them that I could like produce what, at least what they were looking for. Mm-hmm. And then around that same time I started working at a racetrack and that was a little bit more up my alley because I grew up, uh, like my, my older brother raced motorcycles and it was right in my backyard because it was at Miller Motorsports Park and they had a bunch of really cool events there. So I was able to like get in on making like race videos of like world Superbike and some like American Le Mans races and stuff like that. But it was still not much like storytelling. It was just like really flashy images, you know? So, uh, that was right around the time I met Heber and he was already working for CrossFit and that's kind of like, what started me going down the fitness realm. And I was like, how, how can I just like make videos of people working out and make that seem interesting? And it didn't really click to be at first. And I was kind of like weighing my options between well, I wasn't really weighing the timeshare one, but I was weighing my options between like the racetrack or like people working out, you know, mm-hmm. I didn't. And I knew that like, I wanted to tell stories and whatnot, but I just at early on, it just wasn't real clear to me of what I was going to be, what those stories were, you know? Yeah. But that's, I mean, that's amazing that you kind of got your foot in the door and then just walking through these next doors of opportunities as they came up. And so, um, having that introduction then into the fitness realm when you met or the CrossFit realm specifically when you met Heber, um, and you guys, you know, started on this journey together. So was that your first exposure really to CrossFit? Had you, um, taken up this sport before? I mean, how did you kind of find yourself, um, in this realm and decide, I want to go all in and I want to learn all about this sport. I want to, um, start to help kind of with the media side of things so I started doing CrossFit the last year or the last summer that I was playing football and okay it was real it was like pretty quickly like a switch in my head that was like you've been working out like not right your whole life and I've been doing like football and stuff and I just think I was doing like the classic you know bodybuilding type of stuff, but I was still doing like squats and cleans and, and, uh, bench press and stuff like that. But once I got introduced to CrossFit, there was like all these new skills that came along with it that I'd never done before, like gymnastics and like stuff on rings and handstand pushups and, you know, wide variety of stuff. And, uh, my girlfriend at the time was competing at a local competition that, uh, I just wanted to go check out and I was into film. So I was like, I'll film all weekend and I'll just like make a video of my girlfriend, you know? (laughs) And, and I noticed that there was another guy there working, which is Heber. And he was, he was part of the media team there. And so he looked like he was like a lot more official than anybody. And I was like, Hey, if I, if I give you all this footage that I'm shooting all weekend, could I get a media pass? And so I could get back and get better shots of my girlfriend. And he was, super up for that. So I shot with him all weekend. And then at the end of the weekend, we exchanged footage and then, uh, he ended up giving me a contact at CrossFit and I kind of sent in like what I was doing and kind of who I was. And and a week later they sent me to Colorado to do a, a CrossFit endurance certification story on this like up and comer, uh, track athlete. So I went out there and met this, met Brian McKenzie who used to do the CrossFit endurance stuff, but they, uh, had this like phenom from, I think she was from like Kansas or Kentucky, but she'd won the, the 100, 200, 400 and 800 at her state.
state track meet for the past like three years. So wow. that was kind of like my, and I got to like tell that story. And that was like the first time that I had actually got to like do something with like fitness and storytelling. And right away I was like kind of drawn to it just because it was this new emerging sport that nobody like, I, I don't know if like nobody, but a lot of people probably didn't understand that it seemed kind of like a cult and it was kind of, <laughs> it was kind of developing very fast and like each each month and each day that that I was like a part of it it was it was really cool to see how much like every every person would be like coming part of the bandwagon and wanting to be in with the in crowd and learn about crossfit and stuff like that so yeah man yeah. that's I, and i mean that's really cool to kind of be um on the ground floor with the media and kind of take it and and run with it and so at the time were you doing like with that first project that you went on um interviewing that the the young woman the track and field athlete um were you on both the filming side and the post production side were you directing it how um did you have a hand in pretty much the whole project how did it kind of shape out at this at the start for you with working with crossfit yeah early on they would just send like a single shooter out in the field and you would cover what they wanted you to cover and you'd make a video and you'd send it to them. Wow. So it was very like, it was very like small teams back in the day. Like, especially this was like 2010. Uh, so you, you, you usually weren't working with anybody else and it was like your vision and you had to try and like create something great and hope that they liked it. And they usually did. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's kind of what led to like later on in 2011 is when things started really ramping up for the CrossFit games because that's right when like Reebok came on and they had like big, big sponsorship dollars. And one of the craziest weekends was when me and Heber and a few others that we used to work with, we would like shoot all through the weekend making like, you know, sports centers type, you know, like, uh, they call it the update show, but it was like reporting back uh, from the field of like who qualified or who was looking really good throughout the weekend. And while we were producing those, we were driving to San Jose to shoot ESPN pilot episodes to then try and get that greenlit for like post-production shows after the CrossFit Games in 2011. Mm -hmm. And we stayed up all through the night and then I ended up like flying to Panama to cover another one of those events but we ended up getting greenlit and they ended up having to like hire a bunch of people and it was literally going from a team of like five or or so to like doubling and tripling and then and then that's kind of what happened into like the CrossFit media office and the growth there so it it was cool and then Heber was one of the first people that I met that was on the team and he obviously saw the potential early on and he wanted to be a part of it early on and I kind of like saw him as the guinea pig there so he, he went off and he moved to California and they wanted everybody to end up moving there and so once we got greenlit for the the post-production shows then we all moved out there and worked there for like 10 years. Wow. And so for you, Mars, how challenging was it? I mean, of course, you, you loved filmmaking and storytelling and to have this opportunity in this really unique, niched, um, new sport that was coming up. I mean, it's such an incredible opportunity. But then to be told, OK, now you get to move across country and go to California and live here for a while. Um, how challenging was it for you to make that decision to up and uproot yourself and move for this um, for this career, uh, this career path that you're pursuing or was it really challenging for you? Was it just in all in pursuit of this passion and this dream that you had? Uh, I mean, it, it was tough, and it wasn't real clear early on. Like, when I first started for work, working for CrossFit, like, one of the second conversations or so I had with them is they wanted me to move to Santa Cruz, and I was like, I, I'm just trying to figure out if I even like doing this stuff right now, you know? Like, they, they were growing at a rapid rate, and you could tell that they needed all hands on deck, but... Yeah, I, it probably it probably took me close to a year or so to, to finally be like, hey, that's that's the clear, you know, like right choice right now. And it's it's a good career move for me because I can work on projects probably earlier than I would 
otherwise if I worked for somebody else. And I kind of got just thrown in with the bulls and we were producing, you know, I was producing ESPN shows like within 18 months of graduating college. And it's like experience that I wouldn't have gotten otherwise had I not taken the job. So I'm like super fortunate that I got to do that. And that's really what led to, you know, I guess learning how to, produce better and understand storytelling a little bit more and then uh, eventually do a lot more documentary type stuff. Yeah. And so um, in that vein, I mean, it is amazing that you had all this incredible experience so shortly after coming out of college and you were able to really figure out if this was a path you wanted to pursue. I mean, storytelling in all these different ways, um, being on the producing side, the post-production side, all the different areas, being able to shoot film. Um, and so Mars, and from where you started with CrossFit of going to these seminars and filming them and making these videos um, and then being uprooting yourself and moving to California for this full-time position with CrossFit, how did your career start to grow and unfold um, as you do- dove more and more into cro- with CrossFit HQ over the course of those 10 years? Like you said, I mean, you eventually started to make documentaries. So how did your career path and your role kind of grow um, within CrossFit across the course of those years? Uh, so like I said, like we, we started producing content for ESPN and those post-production shows. So that was like something like for being fresh out of college, that was like something that I was like stoked to have the experience, the resume, whatever else. Um, and also like the culture at CrossFit was very, like I got to work with all my friends and it was such a cool office and every day we'd be hiring new people and people that were just like me and Heber and stuff, uh, people that wanted to work with us as much as we wanted to work with them. So it was building my career by just having that like family atmosphere and, and working on projects that I knew were impactful to the broader CrossFit and fitness community because you had this like new emerging sport that people were like super interested in, but people were also like just thrilled to like get to know these characters and the athletes that were competing at the CrossFit games. And I was drawn to that and I, and that's like what's kept me coming back year after year is like this where I'm, I'm just huge fans of the, of the athletes and the community and the sport. And so in, by 2014, Huber had the idea like, Hey, let's make a documentary on rich Froning. And I was like, that sounds awesome. And I want to be a part of that. And he was kind of like, once again, kind of like the, the trailblazer for us at CrossFit and, he really kind of pulled it off that, that first year and it was a major success and we were all very happy with it. And then going into like 2015 was one of the, one of the first years that we like really started the, the fittest on earth franchise that, that we have now that is kind of, we've made five movies now. Uh, and each year we've built on the last years and it's become really cool especially now being uh independent from all that uh that i've been able to work with all my friends for the past 10 years and come up with some really cool content and stuff that people are excited to see that i'm like just thrilled to be a part of and that i'm I'm stoked to have have the career that i have right now and it's very it's super like obscure i guess because like I knew I wanted to tell stories and make, you know, videos and pursue a film career, but I never knew that it would be in a fit fitness realm or anything like that. But it's, it's, I feel like now that me and Heber are kind of just doing our own thing separate from CrossFit, it's really, we're really starting to like come into our own, I would say. Yeah. And, and, and it's become a, a really cool growth period, especially this last year, uh, just getting to, build on everything that we did over the course of 10 years at CrossFit. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think you really um, hit the nail on the head. You never anticipated going into the 
into the fitness world in this way. I mean, with film production and everything you've gotten to do, but it was because you were willing to say yes and willing to, um, when he yeah, saw yeah. that in you, like he called that out in you and you said, all right, I'm going to take this opportunity with CrossFit then. And you walk through those doors and it's just that willingness to say, okay, I'm going to see what comes next. Yeah. I was just super hungry and super passionate about like, even today, like I'll make a video and I'll like watch it back after it's been done, just critiquing like how I can make it better or like what, what things that I think work really well. And then like, I'm super critical of like what I do, but it's like just a passion of, I don't know, it's, it's finding your own voice in storytelling and, and your own style. And me and Heber have a very similar style that works and complements each other very well. And yeah, it's, it's great. I'm, I'm really happy with where we're at yeah absolutely and so with that um that theme of going through those doors of opportunity and um that willingness and that hunger to really be successful and then like you said uh, it's that continuous improvement of yourself of your work of everything that you put out there it's how can I be better and what can I do um to make what I'm putting out there just that much better than what I did before and so in pursuit of that how did Buttery Bros um come into existence and and what is it how did you and Heber come up with it um yeah so just the kind of etymology and the uh, process that buttery bros has taken yeah so the whole time we were at crossfit was like a period of my life and then everything since then in the past like year and a half now has been like a completely new chapter that has been just i i, could, I couldn't even imagine this this the life that i'm living right now and the stuff that we're doing and so i'm like just uh back to your question, basically, um, uh, I would say that once we were at a crossroads with CrossFit and like working with them, it became like very clear that we we're going to need to do something on our own. And I didn't know what I was going to do. Heber didn't know what he was going to do. Like, but we had, all, we'd worked together for all this time and it seemed like, why would we break up the band now? You know, like, yeah. let's, we should try and figure out a way to to keep telling these stories and because we knew that there was an audience for it we just didn't really know how to do it independent of like you know your dad like big dad crossfit you know <laughs> yeah <laughs> so and so buttery bros kind of happened by chance but i mean like we'd always say the term buttery because like when, when we'd like compose a well like compose a shot that turned out amazing. We'd say, Oh man, you got to see this thing. It's buttery. <laughs> and so we just, it was just something we said a lot. It, was, it wasn't ever something I thought that it would be like part of my company, but we, uh, eventually got to the point where we're like trying to take on external work and try and just do like commercial shoots for people like the typical, you know, like independent contractor, freelance work. And, a CBD company called us up and they're like, Hey, we need like a commercial of Frazier and we need it like tomorrow. And we need to fly, have you fly out and film with him. And we were good friends with Matt Fraser. So we went out on new year's Eve to do a commercial for a CBD company. And while we were there, the Matt had just done a workout from Dubai called acid bath. And I'm, I'm sure a lot of people have probably seen the video that turned into acid bath, but that was our first YouTube video. And we went head to head in Fraser's garage and just completely wrecked ourselves. And at the end of it all, I was like looking at the footage and I was like, dude, we got like a lot of funny stuff here. And it's like pretty good banter between me and you and Chris Hinshaw was there and Matt Fraser's there. And I was like, we should just put this thing together and throw it up on YouTube and see what happens. And so we did that. And it happened to be like right when we were going to Wadapalooza last, yeah, last 20, in 2019. And we put it out and people like all of a sudden, like we're walking around in, in Miami and people are calling us the buttery bros and it just kind of stuck right away. And it was super surprising. I was like, wow, I didn't have thought that people would have caught on so quick. Of like, Cause we've been behind the scenes this whole time, you know, like people knew who we were because we made the movies, but we were very behind the scenes. We, we never really like were on camera much. So it was a very different, uh, endeavor, uh, you know? So, yeah. Once we started, once we started doing that, we, what, like, it, we kind of proposed the question to ourselves, like, how can we, like, make this into a show where we can involve sponsors, but also, like, 
get to locations to film with the athletes to keep telling the stories that we want to keep telling that we've been doing this whole time. And it took a few weeks and we did, you know, didn't really know a lot about, you know, like we, we had to like get business savvy cause we're just creative people. And we had to like figure out how to, how to do this all like overnight pretty much. And so, uh, you know, like with a lot of help from like Matt O'Keefe who runs loud and live and stuff like that, he kind of like pointed us in the right direction and what to do. And so a sp- we, we got a sponsor that came on that wanted to pay us to do a segment on one of our shows. And we've had a sponsor ever since the, the, that episode. And so once people like kind of bought into what we were doing and saw that we were, uh, still trying to pursue doing documentaries and to- telling stories, but as well as be on camera and kind of flush out who we were as people and like who we were as creatives and filmmakers. Um, and that's kind of how it all kind of started. And it's been a crazy whirlwind of things ever since. And now, I, you know, the world's crazy right now, but I've got to travel like more than I ever have in the past two years and just be part of stuff that I never thought I would. So it's been great. Yeah. I love that. You get to be part of things that you never even thought you could. And it's because you just, <laughs> you went all in and you, uh, I mean, in a moment of real pivotal transition, like you said, you guys had no idea what you were going to do next. Once um, CrossFit got rid of their media team and just kind of, you were at a crossroads. And so you had to decide, all right, we're going to figure something out together. And so you did, I mean, just going all in and entrepreneurship, starting your own company your own business, learning on the fly. Like you said, you were creative. And so learning the business end of it too, but it was just all in pursuit again of that passion, that dream, um, that drive, that goal that you had. And it's that, you know, that yeah. storytelling. And, um, I love that, you know, finding your voice in storytelling, you just had a desire to tell those stories. Um, and so that was the, you know, I guess that, um, true North that kept driving you. Yeah. And it was, I, I mean, I have a lot of fun being on camera and doing the Buttery Roof show. It's, it's, it's a lot of fun, but, like, going from being behind the camera to on camera, like, I don't know why, but it gives me, like, made me nervous for the first little while, you know? Like, I was like, yeah. what are people going to think of me? What are, you know, like, am I even supposed to be doing this? I should probably be behind the camera, just stay in your lane, you know, type mm-hmm. of thing. But as things progressed, it started to, like, take a, I guess it grew itself a little bit where, all of a sudden, like, I'm doing stuff that normally, like, I used to kind of just, like, shut down whenever I was on video, and I, I would be, like, really reserved, but then when the camera turns off, I'm, like, having a ton of fun and goofing off and being my normal self, you know, but it, it took a little while for me, not so much Heber, he's, he's you know, a human air horn for the most part, <laughs> uh, but the whole time we were trying to pursue doing, like, a a CrossFit series where we would tell like two athlete stories through the weekend and have that be like episodic. And that wasn't really like the the drama kind of got pulled out of it throughout the season when the open happened after a lot of the sanctioned events. And it wasn't even until we, we got to the CrossFit games and we literally like booked our flights and we got an RV and we were, going to the games and we were just going to go to make buttery bro shows like we we weren't going to make a documentary because we didn't we, we just didn't have the team and we didn't have the financials and everything like that and the week before the game our distribution company who kept a, a fairly open conversation with ever since we left crossfit they called us up and they're like hey we're in we'll, we'll help you produce this thing and we want you guys to make another documentary and wow. it's, it's just, it was crazy. I remember like hanging up the phone and like Heber immediately is like jumping for joy. Mm-hmm. Like he's stoked and I'm stoked too. But like deep down inside, I'm like, oh, I'm scared. You know, like yeah. I, I felt, I felt a lot of fear because it was like, I don't know if it was like afraid of failing. Like I know that we're good at what we do, but it was just like, there was, it just seemed like the, the task was so insurmountable to be able to like put together an entire team the week of the games and build a server and make sure that we're still making our sponsors happy for all of our buttery bro stuff that we're committed to. I I just remember being like, dude, I don't know if we can do it. You know, like Mm -hmm. I remember having like serious doubt and it was like, 
I don't know if that's just because I don't know you want to not, not knock it out of the park or something, but it, it took a while, like for me to just be like, "Hey, this is what we're doing. This is what we're doing. I hope we can pull this off." You know? <laughs> and so, and we ended up getting a really good team together within like a week, uh, and somehow we're able to film the entire games and not miss any events, and also film buttery bro shows and uh it took it took until like the middle of october we we were working with our editor mark billingsby and he's sending back like rough edits of stuff that we've been putting together of the documentary and i'm like seeing it take shape and you start getting a little bit more confident you're like okay okay we got something here and as time went on I just got more confident in it until, you know, you're standing at the finish line and you're like, I can't believe that we pulled this thing off because a year ago we literally started from scratch and to produce a documentary like independent of CrossFit and have it not only like be finished, but have it be something like I'm super proud of just because like I made as much as I could with as much with, with what I had, you know, and, and, and I don't know what else I could have done to like improve that with what we had. And, and it's like such a small team and I'm super happy with, with just how it all turned out. Yeah. And I mean, it's an, it's an amazing documentary, what you guys turned out and two to learn after the fact, just the small team that you had and, um, how you truly were up against it. I mean, a week out and trying to put a team together and having that incredible doubt kind of settle in. But then regardless of that doubt and that fear that you had pushing past it and deciding, no, I'm going to, we're going to do this anyway. We're going to figure out how to do it. And I think it's so important to really point that out because it's, you can look at the finished product always like your finished documentary you can go to your youtube channel and watch all the hilarious and great videos that you guys have put out there but then it's behind the scenes it's the work it's everything that you guys do and everything that you put into it and the small manpower that you have to make it all possible um and so to to like to be real and say i we've had doubt it's been fearful sometimes and can we do this can we pull this off but then still coming up against it and still pulling it off i mean that's just the really amazing um amazing part of what you guys do. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it, it's like been such a cool, like lesson to myself of like not letting fear dictate your life or your, like the way you make your decisions or how you live your life. Cause like it had been really easy for me to be like, this is too scary. It's too much risk or it's, it, we're not going to pull it off, you know, and like listen to those voices. It would have been just, I would have regretted it forever, you know? And it's like taught me a lot about like now when something seems that way and I can look at it from a little bit different perspective being like, yeah, this is fearful. This is a little bit uncertain or something like that. And and you know that it's almost like a way to like push you forward in your career or you as a person or learn something more deeply about, you know, what makes you who you are. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I love that. And it's um, truly reflecting back. You're able to say if you had listened to that voice of doubt, um, you would have regretted it forever because look where you are now. Again, being willing and hungry and humble and walking through those doors and um, just seeing what comes out on the other side. And so now Mars, I mean, coming off this incredible thing that you guys pulled off, this beautiful thing that you made and continuing on with Buttery Bros, um, what's next for you guys? What do you see as on the horizon? Are you just um, continuing to to potentially make more documentaries? What's next? Uh, well, there's a lot of things in the works and, you know, as of the current state of the world, it's a lot of things are on pause right now, but, right. um, I, I definitely think that we can like keep doing documentaries. Um, like I, I know that we've, me and Heber kind of already started on our next one, but it's, it's kind of hard to say what'll happen with this season, but what's been really kind of like exciting is is the whole buttery rose show and and like having our brand and being able to like dictate where that goes is kind of like our main pursuit right now because like eventually like and and we've been working to to try and create buttery bros into like an actual show that we can package and sell to a network so that's 
something that we're working on and, and then also, you know, keep our YouTube channel for a little bit more of like the cutting room floor stuff that we can't put in documentaries and stuff like that. So, yeah. uh, something as big as that. And then like, I'd like to be able to have an entire team, you know, like we, we have an editor working with us right now, but like to have, you know, like an almost a whole documentary arm of, of buttery bros and be able to have like TV shows and merchandise and, really just keep continuing to grow that brand and and it's been it's been great i mean i i'm still like i get i kind of laugh at it because like people will be doing these ridiculous dances and litter box moves that we do on our show and it's people do an air horn whenever they see heber it's just like <laughs> i could have never imagined that that would be an actual thing that people latched onto that wanted to just be kind of be part of the group you know yeah I love that. I mean, you develop a following and people just love what you do. And so um, looking forward to, I mean, you got a lot of stuff on the horizon that you're planning for. And like you said, of course, with the what's going on with the world right now, um, some things might be on hold, but just looking forward to, do you guys see maybe um, branching out into areas other than fitness? Are you kind of really niched now into the world of fitness? What does that look like for you? Well, I think we're going to branch out. Like We're already kind of doing that as far as like fitness because like, obviously we started in the CrossFit world. Right. And now we're, we're, we're expanding outwards from that to just more of like the fitness world, you know? And like we want to be able to go train with, you know, people that are bodybuilders and like get a look into who they are up to the Buttery Bro Show and have a comedic thing there but also be able to have our main audience, like CrossFitters, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, but then expanded out from that even further just to be like entertainers you know outside of just fitness right yeah and that makes sense I mean going down and pursuing every possible avenue that you can um to see what sticks and see what works yeah and we've had a lot of support and a lot of like great people to learn from and yeah we're working with a, a manager now so he's got us a little bit more uh focused on on things like bigger picture down the road type stuff that we just me Marson and Heber just wouldn't be able to see all those possibilities like he can so that's been a great help and yeah just kind of flushing out who uh, we bring onto the team to just kind of help us tell these stories and the, the future is bright I think yeah despite, absolutely <laughs> despite despite everything being on pause Yes, really. I mean, it's it's so important right now to look to that bright future that is certainly ahead. And so Mars, I mean, reflecting back with all these truly incredible things that you have accomplished personally in your life and then coming together with Heber and accomplishing with CrossFit and then Buttery Bros and looking forward with all these goals and aspirations and different avenues that you guys are going to walk down. I just have one final question that I ask all of my interviewees. What do you want to be remembered for? Ooh, that's a tough question. <laughs> Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a people pleaser, you know, like I, I want to be known as like, you know, as like a friend to all, you know, for the most part, like I'm, I'm a hard worker and I, I really enjoy conver- conversing with people and sharing my time and, and getting to know people better and just telling people stories. So I guess, uh, be remembered for just the, the buddy that you didn't, that everybody knows that can, you know, make you laugh a little bit, but also not take himself too serious and also throw down on some pretty cool stories like documentaries and stuff like that. Thank you all for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. To learn more about our guest, check out the show notes at keepmovingforward.us. While you're there, go ahead and subscribe to our newsletter to stay up to date on all things coming out of the KMF Collective Studio. Always remember, you can beat the odds and go the distance if only you keep moving forward.